on the telephone, Bob Parsoliti, now retired as a sports writer from the old uh, Herald Mail there. Bob, good morning to you, sir. Hi, how are you all doing? We're doing great. It's uh, great to talk with you again. Uh, when did you retire, Bob? Well, uh, beginning of November, uh, I left uh, the Herald Mail. So you're coming up on a year of retirement. What do you well, think? I'm getting there. I'm halfway there, at least. <laughs> is, it, is it all that it's cracked up to be? Um, it's been uh, interesting. Uh, days seem to go by fast. I haven't really got myself into doing uh, anything uh, employment-wise, I guess, yet. But, uh, you know, I, I, I say I'm catching up on 35 years that I didn't take vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Get it all in at once, man. Get it in at once. Uh, do you still keep up with sports as much as you did before? Uh, yeah, not uh, not. I, I've lost a little bit of my link to the local stuff uh, because not being there and not being in there every day. Much. Mm-hmm. My, my edge of sports. I'm, I've been living and dying with the Cleveland Guardians, and lately it's been mostly dying. <laughs> hey, I'm a Pirates fan. You'll get no sympathy from me, Bob. <laughs> right? Hey, let's uh, let's talk college football. Uh, start the segment off with that, too, because of the major <clears throat> movement in teams. It's kind of interesting that the Atlantic Coast Conference will have a Pacific Coast uh, – a couple of Pacific Coast teams on it, uh, on it, in its conference, but the the names of these conferences mean nothing anymore. Now it's it's obviously it's all set up around TV networks and TV money. But uh, let's talk about the difference in college football conferences from the time you started writing about sports and what we end up seeing now here today, Bob. This is some pretty crazy movement. I I just think that this is like uh, the beginning of the end of the what made college football interesting. I mean with. The way that everything is set up, I mean, obviously it's a money grab, and obviously it's uh, a, a power move for a lot of these things. But it's going to destroy things like rivalries. Uh, I, I think there's going to be a time where you're going to see that uh, there's, uh, you know, the the fan bases aren't going to follow the teams. I mean, how many times are you going to be able to drive uh, across country or travel across country to go watch this your favorite college play football? I mean, not a lot of people are equipped to to do that monetarily or financially. And on top of that, though, I mean, it, it's going to change the landscape of the game because of how the guys are going to be paid for this with this NIL stuff because it's going to become more prevalent and their uh, uh, education is going to fall way behind on this somehow. There's a group of coaches that are calling for a salary cap for NIL money, which is kind of fascinating. And I can well, see that happening. I saw a story that, uh, like, uh, for Pitt, that uh, they put together a, a thing. Uh, I think it was called like the Atlantic 412 or something like that. And every player on that team is going to get paid to play football. And uh, with that, they're going to have to make uh, public appearances. I, I don't know how many people are going to wait in line to see an offensive lineman come strutting out there. But I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, those are the real heroes, baby. <laughs> Matt yeah, I mean, all of a sudden, these guys are going to have to become faces of the uh, of the school, and you know, you open up this portal thing, and all of a sudden, that's college football and college sports' version of free agency. Well, and and Bob, everything is geared towards the game of football, and what gets left out are all of the other sports that now also have to travel these many miles and are you know not going to be revenue generators and so forth it it i'm with you i, I think it's uh, the beginning of the end of what made college sports so fun and so unique and hopefully what it does is maybe drives more people to shepherd university and shippensburg and division two programs well, but, around our but, region but listen you, you bob you say it's beginning of the end matt you say it's the beginning of the end and yet these conferences continue to sign bigger and bigger TV deals, which is what's driving all this in the first place. All the movement is driven by the TV contracts the conferences have. Yeah. So if it's the beginning of the end, why are the TV networks still paying so much money? Well, because they're into the here and now, Rob. Mm -hmm. uh, I, think what, I think what Bob Parasoliti is talking about is after this goes on for a while, you're going to see not only because fans, since the, since fans at uh, a WVU are, are going to get tired of of going to see uh, a ball game at, at Stanford or wherever the heck it is out there because West Virginia really can't afford to do that sort of thing. 
there are going to be fewer of them going to the games in Morgantown. They're just going to be losing interest in it. They'll watch everything on television. And you'll be seeing games in 80,000-seat stadiums with 15,000 people there. Uh, it's, it's, uh, that is, uh, incidentally, I blame all of this on an acquaintance of mine named Stanley Oliver Eikenberry. Now, Stanley Oliver Eikenberry was a student at Shepherd. He was a senior when I started in 1960. His father, Oliver Stanley Eikenberry, was the president of Shepherd College at the time. Later, Stanley Oliver Eikenberry became president of the University of Illinois, and it was his idea to bring Penn State into the Big Ten. And that's where all of this started. Well, we agree on that point. Uh, the P- Penn State not getting into the Big East. You can you can cite Mr. Eikenberry, but you have to also cite the basketball playing schools of the Big East at the time for voting down Penn State's membership because that drove Penn State to the Big Ten. If you ever watch the Requiem for the Big East on ESPN 30 for 30, they cover that. And the uh, I guess it was Dave Gavitt who said at the time, uh, we will all regret the day we voted down Penn State because – Gavitt wanted Penn State to get into the Big East uh, uh, for the conference. Uh, so anyway, okay. anyway, Bob, I, I guess this leaves kind of Notre Dame is is the last free agent college out there of note right now, still unaligned uh, with the football conference. Do you see any chance of Notre Dame joining the Big Ten anytime in the near future? Well, uh, that's yet to be seen. Uh, I mean, the guy, the, the people that are standing uh, and trying to keep them independent are about to leave Notre Dame. The AD is going to retire. Uh, the guy, I think the president's going to be turning like 70 years old here pretty soon. Uh, I mean, a lot of their influence is probably going to be going away. And, I mean, our, Notre Dame already has the money grab. Everybody wants it just because it's that icon. But it's not that icon and basically football. And the, the statement uh, that Matt made about the, the uh, non-revenue schools, for years, all these uh, – Schools said football's the driving force that we can have these uh, non-revenue sports because it pays for everything. So the excuse is going to be that they're going to be able to pay for more things like that. But I, I read, a, I was reading something, and they were talking about, okay, you got a power soccer team out in, uh, say, USC, and they're going to fly – uh, across country for our Thursday night game in uh, at Rutgers now. You know, I mean, how many times are you going to be able to take these kids and pull them across? And and I'll, I think in in essence, what uh, John said about the the I, I think the college football has been losing steam for a while uh, because of the discrepancy, because of uh, everybody upset that there's only four teams in the playoffs, because. Uh, you know, it gets more and more expensive, and and you know, for uh, fans to go there, I think the you're seeing the fan base erode in every sport basically right now because of all of that, and and the TV revenue, even though it brings it into your living room, is eroding the people that get passionate about it. It's fascinating to me. We want more money so that we can spend more money is really what it boils down to, right? right? Because the cost of teams traveling all the way across the country, WVU right now having their shortest road trip in the Big 12 is what to Iowa State, 900 plus whatever miles, you know, almost 1,000 miles. All of that costs more. And the fans are alienated because they can't go to the games and so forth. Wouldn't it have been just as good to still be able to be in a situation where you can play Pitt and Penn State and Virginia Tech and those kind of schools on a regular basis? Your fans get to go. It doesn't cost as much money, and you'd probably be in a very similar spot than what you are right now, other than, I guess, the huge TV revenue money. But that's that's falling apart, though, too. I mean, look at what's going on with Bally Sports and all of those you know type of, of entities in Major League Baseball and others who were willing to go, yeah, we'll give you billions of dollars, and now it's not quite working out for them. Well, and I, I mean, I've always thought that uh, WVU made a mistake by going to the Big 12. And the reason why is they played a certain brand of football when they were in the Big East and, and when they were in the conference like that. The minute they went to the uh, Big 12, it was a different style of play. It's, I mean, there's, it's like uh, an electric football game. There's no defense. They just run up and drive right up and down the field trying to score points. And 
WVU can't get the athletes to stay with those guys because of where they're at as far as the conference uh, alignment goes. Well, I don't think WVU had a choice, though. They couldn't get into the well, ACC, so where else were they going to go? That's true. I understand that. But, uh, you know, I, it's kind of like the weather. If you stand for five minutes, it's all going to change. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's been the constant. It's always constant change. There's always somebody else. And if they sat there for a little bit and waited a year or two, there was pro- and they remained a powerhouse, they may have got picked up by somebody else. I mean, nobody could uh, uh, guess who? this stuff. Was yeah, who, happen. Bob? The Big Ten wasn't going to take him, and the ACC wasn't going to take him. And, and the both- SEC had no interest. That's right. But right now, there's a, they're grabbing just names, uh, it seems like, some of these leagues. They're just I mean – Cincinnati made, uh, was what a couple of years ago. They weren't. They were down in their, uh, a smaller, smaller schools, but because they had a couple of successful seasons, now all of a sudden they're part of uh, the. I think that they're in the Big Twelve now. Well, and again, some of that's probably being driven by market. I mean, I'm not saying Cincinnati's a huge, huge market, but it is a pretty good sized city. So you got to imagine that a lot of these conferences are looking at schools just because it brings in a certain possibility of viewership on TV, which could lead to bigger contracts. Well, that's that's part of like what the Big 12, I, I, another thing I was reading about the Big 12, they were targeting like uh, Virginia and North Carolina to bring them into the Big 10. And part of it, in, and I don't know if they still are, but part of uh, when they were looking at them, there was the cultural aspect because they brought the, more of a, you know, uh, kind of, uh, say, tra- kind of highbrow tradition. I don't know. I mean, you know how uh, they're considered very high, highly educational type programs and all that other stuff. So, I mean, I think, you know, it's getting away from more than, uh, you know, just getting better fit. It's just getting, trying to get names that people recognize, I think, now. Is the Rose Bowl – Joining the the playoff uh, bowl games, they're in it now. Coming up, yeah, they got one this year. I think they got one of the semifinals. Okay, so they already they're in. It. What's what's the future of the Rose Bowl if the Pac-12 collapses, or does it no longer matter with the playoff system? Well, do the bowl do bowl games matter anymore? Really? No, I don't I mean, mean if bowl games matter anymore. Yeah. The, the Rose Bowl is the Rose Bowl. It's a, mm-hmm. that's a different yeah. bowl game than everything else. It's in its own category. But that Rose Bowl is always Big Ten versus the Pac-12. There, Not anymore. There is no Pac-12 now. Right. So what becomes of the Rose Bowl? It's just one of the major bowls that they rotate the championship game around and the two semifinal games. So it would never. It was never going to continue to be the Pac-12 and the oh and the that Big stopped Ten anymore. That's three or four years now. ago. That no, they, yeah, they, well two years ago I think they played up. There was a Big Ten Pac-12 matchup. I, 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 yeah, when it's available, they do it. But if the the if, but if the if it's playoff, the playoff schedule, system, that's different. I get that. Part. Yeah, if, it, 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 yeah. I think uh, if the playoff schedule interferes with that, then no, they don't do that. Oh, they try to match yeah. them up that way. All right. Well, it'll be interesting to find out what happens with all those. And, and incidentally, talk about the Atlantic Coast Conference now. The rumor is that that Clemson and Florida State are going to leave and go to the Southeastern Conference. So, yes. However, uh, the ACC has something built in where the exit payment is pretty punitive. Um, and that contract, I think, goes to 2035. 36, 36. I think. 36. I read, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's, it'll cost if you. If the SEC wants them, the SEC will come up with the money. Well, they have it. <laughs> yeah, they do. <laughs> they Which well, leads me, Bob, to my next question. In rotating forward, go, you go maybe 10 years in advance here into college football. Does it morph into its own thing, kind of like a, a second pro league of consequence? Well, I, I think it's it's heading in that direction. Uh, I, I mean, you know, even the uh, you talk about the NFL. I mean, some of the talent base in that in the league is really eroding. The the, the way the game is played and and uh, some of the it doesn't seem to have some of the clout it used to have. But I mean, it, it, uh, you're paying your athletes. You're traveling all over the country. Uh, you're, you know, uh, all that stuff. I mean, all that stuff is, and the, 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 I think the thing that's funny about it, especially with the NIL, some of these guys, this is the only time they're going to be making money playing football. 
some of these, you know, I mean, with as many people and how many, and many uh, guys that move up to the pro level to get those contracts and even the, the minimal contract are going to be go, uh, is small now, and these guys are going to be making their money in college. And then, the, then no pro career after that, right? Well, possibly not, you know. Yeah. I mean, and probably the only, uh, you know, the, the guys that uh, are the grunts and all this are the linemen again. I mean, I was reading somewhere or talking to somebody, and we were talking about how by about the fourth or fifth uh, week of the season, you got guys playing on the front line of professional football teams that are just walking off the streets because everybody's hurt. <laughs> you know, I think <laughs> because of the way that TV has gone and everything is going to streaming now, all the ad revenue is going to streaming, uh, you got a subscription base that you can get with streaming as well. I think college football kind of morphs into – if you think about the European model for football, we call it soccer, where you've got a variety of leagues leading up to a Premier League, which is what the NFL would be the Premier League equivalent, right? And you're already seeing it now kind of with the XFL, the USFL, there's another FL in there somewhere. And then you've got all these college athletes that are coming through in that 18 to 22-year-old bracket, right? They're getting paid when they're in college. They might not be good enough for the NFL, but because of the need for television programming, and we already know from watching the writer's strike and the actor's strike right now, that that's a volatile situation and it costs a lot of money to produce a program, whereas it doesn't cost that much money to produce a sports program, relatively speaking, to developing a script and getting it out there, right? You, you got a steady supply of people coming out of college who are now going to be used to making money playing football. We're just going to yeah, take it to the next level, and, and and I think they'll just I think there'll be a continuous development of more minor leagues ready for television programming that'll be streamed in football. Well, I mean the way that uh, the uh, TV industry got around that though too is it was called it's called reality TV. You throw a camera and a bunch of a bunch of people that are acting like idiots. And, and <laughs> They're not and acting; they are <laughs> playing themselves. <laughs> But you talk about the money factor. How about the idea that a company like ESPN is now joining with Penn and creating gambling sites as well? So the very people that cover these events, that pay great amounts of money to be able to put these events on television, now have a backhanded way of getting some pretty good matchups and setting up things the way that, to me, it is absolutely unethical to think that, that you know a company like that would be able to be in that type of business but there's where more revenue comes from to be able to continue to add to we're going to sign these huge contracts with these huge leagues like the sec and acc but on the other side of that i, I think it's kind of uh the, the trend of way uh the way that you should go because how do you create more um interest in the game uh i mean with people that have skin in the game because they're betting on it all of a sudden, they're watching games because they're trying to make sure they're, you know, if they're going to win, they're better now. Yeah. So again, the crazy fan is always the one that gets screwed yeah. in the whole thing, right? Because I, I can't afford to go to the game. I can't afford to go see them when they play on the other side of the country. You know, if I want to watch it on TV, I've got to have some kind of satellite service, cable service, outside service, and or I'm paying some kind of streaming service. And then what the heck? I may as well throw a few bucks on the game, and maybe I'll make something. And the fan is the one in the end that has empty pockets and doesn't even get to really watch or enjoy their team. But, you know, I mean, it's the, it's the worm on the hook, basically, you know, and we're the fish. <laughs> yeah, we're the fish. <laughs> it's good for everybody but the worm. Yeah. Exactly. Hey, uh, Bob, is there anywhere anyone can still see any of your musings or writings since you've uh, quit the regular daily grind of a sports writer? Um, I really haven't written much of anything. <laughs> Uh, since I, I left, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm hoping to maybe get into something. I'm, I'm not sure where it's going to go or when it might pop up, but uh, I'm, I'm hoping to try to get out there again a little bit. I know Matt has a Hagerstown baseball question. Yeah, for I you. just wanted to ask your thoughts on the flying boxcars and seeing the construction underway for the new stadium. I know you've been covering that for a long, long time. What are your thoughts? Uh the league itself is kind of interesting. Uh, I was uh, I was talking with uh, David Blankstone, the 
the uh, GM of the black box cars. And uh, I uh, to helped him out. I sat down and I did a, uh, a thing trying to figure out how many Hagerstown sons made it to the major leagues, at least for one game. And uh, I went through and I figured out that there was 241 players over the time that had made it. And some of them were pretty significant. Uh, some of them are just, you know, kind of guys. And uh, while I was doing it, I was like uh, going down memory lane and I was finding guys. And I said, gee, I wonder what happened to this guy. And I Googled his name. And like one guy who played for uh, the Blue Jay group, he now owns Medicine Hat uh, minor league team, which used to be the team that fed – uh, was the, the level below the Suns in, in Toronto organization, you know, and guys that are football are, are, are baseball coaches at colleges and stuff now I was finding. So, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in there that brings a lot of the history of that game that, uh, and why baseball is important. Now, with the, and the, uh, and the uh, Atlantic League coming in, it's going to be an interesting dynamic because, you know, Hagerstown had trouble – uh, for a number of reasons, but they were actually getting players from team, the team bringing them in here. Now they're going to have to go out and sign their own players. It, the the uh, dynamic works elsewhere, but I don't know how it fits into that. Yeah, because they're. The, the, I, I like the idea in a sense because if you're bringing players in, you're bringing guys in that are likely going to be there for a whole season that a community can kind of gather around, if you will, as opposed to you know guys that come in and might be there for a handful of weeks or months and then you know moving up the ladder to the double A or the high single A. And also, and also, you're you're going to get probably overall better players than you would have on a low A minor league team. It'll be comparable to a uh, probably a double A team right. when they get them. Right. I mean, one thing uh, I noticed when I was doing the thing with the Suns on a number of guys, uh, how many guys that made it to the majors end up coming back and playing in like the Atlantic League uh, because they're trying to stay active to be re-signed. And you'll see occasionally a guy getting uh, – sold off of the like Lancaster and going uh, to the Brewers or something I saw recently. So you're going to have that kind of stuff. You're going to have ex major leaguers coming down. I mean, right now the Frederick team that's in the uh, Atlantic league that just joined this year, three ex sons are playing for them, you know? So, I mean, those guys could possibly come back here and play again. Have you seen this? The other part of it is they're trying to stay very local. These teams, uh, I, they, they, hire uh, local people to run it. They hire local folks. Uh, they bring in local guys that have interest in playing here. Uh, they get the manager that it has a local type uh, presence. Uh, for example, when Lancaster came in, they hired Tommy Herr, who used to play second base for the uh, St. Louis Cardinals and Phillies. And he was a, uh, he had, uh, he's from Lancaster, and they, they made him the manager. He was the manager here for a couple of years. I remember Tommy Herr. He had 100, 100 RBIs and less than 10 homers in a season. Pretty unusual yep. style. Line. There's a couple hey, of those guys do, around. Do you, <laughs> have you seen the Savannah Bananas or heard their story? It's like the Harlem I've Globetrotters seen, of baseball? I've, I've seen them on video, uh, some of them. And, heck, there's some major league guys playing for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think uh, I know um, – oh, geez. Uh, oh, uh, Barry Zito mm -hmm. and Johnny Damon had been playing with them for a while. I don't know if they're still there or not. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know either. But I know uh, I saw a sixty minutes thing on them, and it was, or maybe it was, uh, I think it was Real Sports. Brian Campbell. Um, that it was a blast, man. I'd have to take in one of those games whenever I saw them. I uh, uh, one of the uh, coaches over here in the area had gone down. His son lives down in the Savannah area, and they went to one of the games. He says, "I'm not a baseball fan." fan but he's uh, uh and i'm not you know I, it's not i don't like the sport i just don't watch it he goes but that was a heck of a good time <laughs> yeah. apparently it's quite a show yeah 
Uh, go ahead, Matt. I was just going to ask, have you ever seen the documentary, The Battered Bastards of Baseball? Yeah, on Netflix. Yeah. because Kurt the, the, Russell's father. Yeah, an excellent story. Uh, in Portland, and basically they had a minor league team. It wasn't working out. Major League Baseball pulled it. You know, Kurt Russell's dad went, what? No, we need baseball here. They created an independent league team. And over a handful of years, the city was so in love with them and everything went so well that MLB came back in and basically said, all right, we're taking over again. It's a very <laughs> Very fascinating. And then ruined it. Yeah. So, right. So, I, you know, <laughs> maybe for Hagerstown, this independent team becomes something like that that, you know, draws in the interest and, in, you know, hopefully even from the region as, as a whole. I know I'll, I'll head over and watch games. Bob, good I, to I, talk I, with you again, man. Oh, good. Finish up. I'm sorry. I, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm going to be interested to see what happens. I mean, I hate to say that I don't think it's going to make it. I think it's going to have some merit, but I'm just wondering about the longevity of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but with that being said, I remember back in the day when uh, the Suns were moving to Frederick when they were opening the door to bring the double A team here in the early 90s. And I was talking with somebody from Frederick, and he was saying that Frederick will never uh, you know, support a team like this. And I was telling him, you know, you're going to have all these grandparents that want to take their grandkids out to uh, baseball games but don't want to drive that hour down 70 to go to Baltimore. You're going to have – guys that are coming home and they want to go out for a couple of beers and, and watch a game and uh, it's close to home. And I mean, for a while there, Frederick really took off, you know, but then, you know, the whole landscape and the way that the, the, the things were run and uh, with the minor leagues kind of fell apart. And so they were a casualty just like Hagerstown. Well, you know, they didn't lose the franchise because of a lack of attendance. I mean, they still were no. se- they still were selling tickets, and even even with the with the nothing teams that they have now, they still on Friday nights and Saturday nights bring in a really good crowd, and uh, people still go to Harry Grove Stadium because it's a family experience. Mm-hmm. The baseball secondary to what else is going on, right? Well, a part of it uh, in in Frederick's part was I think the, it was an argument, and it was the same thing with Hagerson. Argument was over the facility. Yes, uh, Harry Grove That's is thirty five years old now, from. right? Mm-hmm. So anyway, great to talk with you, Bob. Good to catch up with you, and, and uh, continued uh, resting in your retirement, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me on. It makes me feel like I know something. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good day, man. You too. Thanks a lot.